I am the one. Goodbye to me, the Benjamin. Give it a thunderbolt. Um, the Twilight. Previously on Game Theory, Link was in a coma. Or dead. Mario was diagnosed with a mental disorder. And got shot. But will probably survive. What will happen tonight? Don't touch that dial. But first, a message from our sponsors. Ovaltine, Ovaltine. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the true definition of must-see TV on YouTube. Anyone remember Monster in My Pocket? No, not that monster in my pocket. Get your minds out of the gutter. This monster in my pocket. The 1991 Konami NES classic. And by classic, I really just mean old, because it wasn't that good. It was one of those games designed to manipulate kids into buying the related toys. Kind of like Skylanders. Here's the best summary I could come up with. You know that off-brand of ketchup? that looks like a Heinz bottle, but you get it home and you suddenly realize it's not ketchup, it's fancy catsup? This game is catsup. Generic and not as tomato-y as Heinz 57. You play as either monster or vampire for the whole thing. No, not Frankenstein or Dracula. You think Konami shelled out the dollars to get those names? Ha. Huh. Then you spend the game running around what looks like your grandma's Florida condo, which is huge because you're supposed to be really small. Get it? Monster in my pocket? They're small? No, not that monster. Stop it. Every monster is a one-hit kill, your attack is a little energy swipe in front of you, and I love this game. Seriously. And it was all for one reason. The ending. The game ends. Do I need a spoiler alert for a 23-year-old game? What's the etiquette for this? I mean, most of you whippersnappers were just twinkles in your parents' eye at the time anyway. The game ends with you beating your arch-nemesis Warlock, again really digging deep for those creative names, and you sitting your generic little butt down to some TV to celebrate. At this point, my controller's down and I'm kicking back to watch me some credits when all of a sudden, Warlock's back and he's shooting fireballs through the TV! I was shocked. At this point, six-year-old MatPat is scrambling around frantically for the controller trying to fight back. Anyway, you win, the fight's really not that hard, and you get credits. It's super lame, but pretty much on par with what the rest of the game's like. But that one moment of genuine surprise redeemed this otherwise forgettable game and stuck with me so much that here I am talking about it now. Which brings us to the question of the day. Just how far are we from literally fighting a boss that reaches out of our TV screens to get us? The interesting thing is, this isn't a video game question. With motion controls and force feedback continually getting better, the one-to-one -one experience of player-to-game is at an all-time high and will only continue to get better. Now, the limiting factor isn't the controller here, it's the television. I'm talking about achieving a state of pure immersion, and that responsibility not only rests on the game, but also the screen you play it on. So really the question of the day is, just how immersive can TV get? Well, to truly understand that, we need an idea of TV's evolution up to this point. The fundamental concept of television is quite tricky if you think about it. You're Converting a real-life object into a 2D image, then using electricity to transmit that image and recreate it onto another screen. And yet, for as complicated as that sounds, the ability to do it has been around since the late 1800s, when German inventor Paul Nipkov created the Nipkov disc, named after himself. Super original, the guy could have had a spot on the monster in my pocket design team. No, not that monster, behave yourself. The Nipkov disc could be made of pretty much anything and had a spiral of holes punched into it. An image would project onto the spinning disc, and the spinning holes would basically cut up that image point by point, line by line. The light that shined through the disc's holes as it was spinning were recorded and then projected onto a screen in individual vertical strips that were then put back together to look like an image. 
Well, by today's standards, this looks like something straight out of the opening credits of American Horror Story. In the early days, this was mind-blowing. Using this mechanical technology, the first in-home TVs came out in 1928 and only produced an image the size of a postage stamp. To even be visible, a magnifying glass literally had to be installed inside the television set to blow up the image for the big screen. This mechanical era of television lasted until the early 30s when the first cathode ray TV saw prime time. Get it? <laughs> prime time? It's a TV joke. <sighs> Whatever. The cathode ray is a lot more complicated than the Nipkov disc, but the basic gist is that you have an electron gun at one end and a fluorescent panel at the other. The TV image is created by blasting the electron gun at the fluorescent screen really fast in a specific pattern to light up parts of the screen. Quite literally, your TV was playing something akin to Duck Hunt in order for you to play Duck Hunt. A jumbo screen, which, mind you, was 12 inches at the time, cost about $1,200 of today's money. Also, to avoid the electron gun firing radiation into little Johnny's breakfast cereal during Saturday morning cartoons, the TVs had to contain big lead plates, making these things super heavy. Despite each set being a mini Chernobyl disaster, cathode ray TVs were the first big innovation in television technology to really take hold with the public, with everyone buying these things up to see shows like the first ever TV crime drama, the aptly named Telecrime, which was then followed by Telecrime New York, Telecrime Miami, and Telecrime SVU. Soon, multiple electron ray guns were installed and made to fire in each primary color, bringing color TV into existence. But because you couldn't really shrink CRTs, they eventually reached a size limit with the biggest ever made in 1991 at about 61 inches and weighing almost 750 pounds. Yeah, and you thought that two pound laptop you had a couple years ago was impractical. Cathode ray tubes bit the dust in the early 90s, much to the relief of every moving company in America, but the race for the best television was literally heating up fast with the brand new plasma TVs. See, things were heating up because plasma TVs take advantage of inert gases that are inherently non-reactive, so the TVs don't experience a significant temperature change. So, actually, that joke made no sense. Hmm. Basically, these TVs took the concept of a neon bar sign and applied it to your favorite primetime programming, where the TV is lit by running an electric current through a combination of neon, argon, and xenon to glow in different color combinations. Interestingly enough, each TV manufacturer had their own proprietary blend of plasma, kind of like a secret sauce. But do you like yours, smooth, chunky, or with extra argon? Around the same time, LED LCD models started to come out. LCDs, or liquid crystal displays are made of tiny crystal structures that are actually fluid and change orientation when put under an electric current. It quickly became the lightest way to produce higher and higher resolution TV images and currently dominates the market. So fast forward to today, I started this episode with a question, how realistic can TVs get? And said that the television screen was truly the limiting factor in immersing us in a video game. The thing is, that's not entirely correct. Our human limitations are the true limiting factor factor. At the Consumer Electronics Show in January of this year, there were two big stories coming from companies like Samsung. First, 4K resolution. TVs with four times the number of pixels as 1080 HD screens. 4K technology means we're watching TVs with basically an 8.3 megapixel resolution. Now consider this. According to an incredible recent video by Vsauce, the human eye's resolution really caps out around 7 megapixels in a relatively small focal point. In other words, technology is quickly approaching levels where it's surpassing our ability to process it. But where do you go from there? If we're capping out resolutions, how else do you reach that immersive boss fight we started the episode with? Well, that was the other big story of CES. Curved TVs. Screens designed to literally surround you with the game you're playing, providing a wider periphery view, giving you a field of vision in first-person shooters, for example, that actually behaves like the way we see the world. Honestly, it's an experience you have to see to believe. With curved TVs drawing you in, 4K 
resolution that begins to test the limits of the human eye, and 3D technology that actually puts you in the world of the game, TVs seem to have really reached the pinnacle of creating the ideal immersive experience. At least from a vision standpoint. The next step would be incorporating all our other senses, but honestly, I have no desire to smell the great and mighty poo or get PTSD from being a soldier on Call of Duty's battlefield. And there again, we see human limitations inserting themselves in the way of true immersion. And how about incorporating real movement into our experience? Well, then we're limited by our physicality and endurance, and I'm sorry, but I'm not about to run around in front of my screen just so I can feel more like a soldier. Personally, I don't want to be that immersed. So the question isn't so much how realistic our gameplay experience can get, probably the better question is, how realistic do we want it to get? Personally, when it comes to immersion in a playing experience, I think I'll be perfectly happy with the technology available to us now. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Next time on YouTube's Game Theory. You didn't. I couldn't. Mario. Sonic. What? I suck. I have a confession. Welcome back to the Super Amazing End Card Tournament, where last time you thought that there wasn't an actual tournament, but there was. I was seeing if more of you clicked the bottom or the top half of the image that linked to Gerard's Final Fantasy VII series. The top half won by 300%, so very clearly you guys like it on top. This week, it's your chance to pick an episode of Game Theory for the month of June. Would you rather see me cover the spontaneous combustion of Minecraft creepers, or the effectiveness of dating sim tactics in real life. Click on one to choose, even though we all know which one's gonna win, <coughs> Minecraft, <coughs> and see your choice come to life sometime in June. It's like a choose your own adventure web series. Looking forward to having you guys be a part of the episode selection process. That's all theorists.